Surely one of the most unsettling things in life is to be walking or jogging along your way only to stumble across a dead or severely injured body. Why, I remember the first time it happened to me. Some of my high school friends and I from the drama department decided to take a walk across the Golden Gate Bridge after meeting for lunch at the Presidio. As we approached the north tower of the bridge, I looked down and saw a bloated white torso half in the water and half on the rocks below. At 220 feet from the bridge deck to the water, facial features were not distinct to me, but even at that distance one sensed they were seeing something tragic and existentially frightening in terms of life at an end. He was most likely a suicide, and at this point was a floater. Though young, I knew that after the body initially sank, expanding gases in the chest cavity caused him to float back to the surface. What can I say? I didn't get that from school. I watched a lot of cop shows and movies. The streets of San Francisco was my favorite. Yes, even more than the venerable Adam-12. As we continued on across the bridge, authorities arrived for the removal of the body to the medical examiner's facilities. That experience, however, was minor compared to the next time. A few years later, my brother and I were driving through the avenues in San Francisco. As we approached Terrebelle Street next to an apartment building with bay windows, something caught my eye. A young woman who appeared to be in her late teens was lying on her side on the sidewalk, motionless. As we slowed to a stop, I could see she had a facial injury, but no one else was around. I jumped out of the vehicle and ran over, kneeling beside her. It looked like someone had hit her with a baseball bat and left her there. Teeth were lying in front of her face and part of her chin was split open, revealing bone underneath. There was some blood, but mostly it was oozing out from under her head. She was perfectly still and not making a sound, yet I could detect there was some life in her. Another man approached from somewhere and ran into the apartment lobby to call an ambulance. My brother got out of the vehicle but kept some distance. This was not an easy thing to see in the middle of a bright and sunny day. I leaned down close to her and gently asked, What happened? She whispered back with no detectable emotion or pain, Suicide. I was completely stunned. I looked up and saw one window on the third floor, open. I may have gasped, I may have whispered, Oh no, I certainly thought it, no, not to one so young. She had climbed through that open window and let herself drop to the cement below, causing severe injuries, but not death. We could hear the ambulance was on its way. My brother said, let's go, but I stayed at her side a few more moments until the ambulance arrived, and as soon as they did, I pulled myself away. You would think the expression on the girl's injured face would have stayed with me, but there was no expression, just injury. What I will never forget is the expression on the face of the female EMT when she exited the ambulance and first saw the girl. A wave of emotions flooded her face, somewhere between grief and compassion. She looked like she wanted to cry, but she had a job to do. The next day there was nothing in the newspaper, so after work I drove over to the apartment building and rang up the manager to see if he knew how the victim was. All he knew was that she was in San Francisco General Hospital in the psych ward. She was not allowed visitors. She was in her early 20s and perhaps had been alone in the apartment for too long, left there by a relative who had gone out of town. I imagine she had a long road ahead to recovery. I still have a tough time thinking about it, and yet for first responders, they see things like this and much worse again and again. We certainly owe them much respect and gratitude. In both these cases, foul play was probably not expected, but the police would still review any evidence that might be available. 
In the case of the body beneath the Golden Gate Bridge, a medical examiner trained in forensics would determine the cause of death because after all, just because a body turns up in the bay doesn't mean the person drowned. There was a time in this country when forensic pathology was an unknown or little understood science. Dead bodies were examined by doctors, detectives, coroners, and even undertakers, and often they did a pretty good job in determining causes of death. Now and then, though, bodies presented such unusual wounds and decomposition that it was difficult to tell what happened. Was the death the result of murder, suicide, or accident? Which brings me back to those rare occasions when a carefree passerby in lonely places discovers a dead body or even a part of one such as feet in tennis shoes in Vancouver, Canada, a true story, or in fiction, when Kyle McLaughlin's character's Jeffrey Beaumont, who in the 1986 David Lynch film Blue Velvet, discovers a human ear in a field. This film is one of my favorites for its many layered revelations of criminal and psychological horrors hidden beneath the surface of an otherwise ordinary American small town. Dennis Hopper plays a violent psychopath in the movie named Frank Booth, whom Jeffrey discovers has ties to the human ear. Jeffrey asks, why are there people like Frank? Why is there so much trouble in this world? That type of question is often asked, and no doubt was on the minds of the Tulare and Fresno County Sheriffs back in 1957, when during the typically hot month of August, a dead body was found hanging from a tree near Reedley, California, by the Kings River. So horrific was the discovery that it must have appeared like a scene from the Grand Guinal Theater of Horror. Here I'll read from a few vintage newspaper reports as the story went across the country. Headline, Victim Hanged by an Ankle in Torture Death, Visalia, California, August 18, 1957. The body of a Japanese farm laborer, Shijati Tanaka, 65, was found hanging by one ankle in dense underbrush on the bank of the Kings River last night. He apparently had been tortured to death. Sheriff Sandy Robinson of Tulare County said an autopsy indicated Tanaka of nearby Reedley died several days ago from blood running to the head. He had been beaten severely. The body was found not far from Reedley, just over the Tulare County border, by four young men from Reedley. Headline, Manhunt on for Torture Slayer, Vaselia. Sheriff's deputies using bloodhound searched in vain over the weekend for clues in the brutal torture murder of 65-year-old farm laborer who was found hanging by one ankle from a cottonwood tree near the Kings River Friday night. Tulare County Sheriff Sandy Robinson said the man, Shijatura Tanaka, apparently had been whipped and burned with a lighted cigarette. There were more than 50 wounds on his body. However, an autopsy indicated that the cause of death was hanging upside down. Robinson said the brutal slain appeared to be the work of a sadist because Tanaka, who lived in the area for more than 20 years, had no known enemies. Ten sheriff's deputies and volunteers searched the riverbank hoping to determine how the victim was brought to the scene. Four young men from nearby Reedley on their way to the river for a swim found the body dangling upside down about two feet off the riverbank turf. A piece of lightweight cotton rope was tied to one ankle and slung over a branch of the tree. The man apparently had worked the other ankle loose. Coroner's deputies said Tanaka had been dead for several days. The preliminary autopsy report showed that Tanaka died from shock and congestion of blood in the brain. Headline, Torture Victim Dies Hanging by Leg, by Celia. 
Sheriff deputies tonight pressed bloodhounds into the search for clues in the brutal torture slain of a Japanese farm laborer whose body was found hanging by one leg from a tree on the banks of the King's River. The man, Shijitura Tanaka, 65, apparently had been whipped and burned with a lighted cigarette, but an autopsy indicated the actual cause of his painful death was being suspended upside down. Working the dogs back and forth under the glare of searchlights, the officers hoped to find how the victim was brought to the scene. Sheriff Sandy Robinson of Tulare County said Tanaka probably died several days ago. His body was discovered about 5.30 p.m. yesterday by four youths from the nearby town of Reedley. Sheriff's Captain James Flutey said investigators have ruled out robbery as the motive for the torture murder. His deputies found a small amount of money in Tanaka's pants pocket. The laborer apparently had been strung up to the tree by both heels, but was hanging by only one when his body was found. Flutie said Tanaka may have kicked one leg loose in a desperate struggle to free himself. His head was suspended about four feet above the turf of the riverbank, Flutie said. The autopsy report showed that Tanaka died of shock and from congestion of blood running to his head. Flutie said Tanaka's body was bruised as though somebody whipped him once they got him up there. The officer also reported finding marks on Tanaka's body which he believed were caused by a lighted cigarette tip. Sheriff's deputies from Tulare and Kings County and police from Reedley were investigating the slain. Headline Torture slain remains a mystery. Neither clues nor motive could be found today in the torture murder of Shitatera Tanaka, elderly transient strawberry picker, whose body was found hanging by one leg from a cottonwood tree. Sheriff Sandy Robinson of Tulare County said investigators have made scant progress since four young men en route to a swimming session found the body Saturday evening on the south bank of the Kings River. The victim had been whipped and tortured with a lighted cigarette. Robinson said Tanaka, 65, a recent arrival in Reedley from Los Angeles, apparently was driven to a road near the death scene and then was walked about 200 yards to the tree. When found, he had been dead about 12 hours, according to Dr. James A. Sargent, who established cause of death as the blood that rushed to the Japanese farmhand's head. But how long he had hung there before death came could not be determined. He was last seen alive Thursday night by the landlady of his rooming house in Reedley. There, investigators found a receipt for a $200 money order August 9th to his only known relative, a brother in Japan. On August 6th, Tanaka had been held overnight in the Reedley jail as a drunk. Authorities were checking whether fellow inmates may have learned of the money that Tanaka sent three days later to his brother. However, investigators noted the killer or killers left some small change in the victim's pocket. Headline Coroner's Verdict Finds Japanese Took Own Life A Fresno County Coroner's Inquest has ruled that Shijatera Tanaka, 66, a Japanese farm laborer, took his own life by hanging himself by the foot. The unusual suicide verdict came at the inquest yesterday after the testimony of investigating officers, a pathologist, and the physician who examined the man's body after he was cut down from the branch of a tree near Reedley. Under Sheriff Norman C. Robb said the man's shoes were sitting side by side near his hat. There were no signs of a struggle, and although officers found car tracks nearby, 
They said there was no indication that they were connected with Tanaka's death. When the man was first found last Saturday by four youths who were on a swimming party, authorities believed Tanaka had been beaten and possibly tortured with cigarette burns before he was hanged in the tree by the left foot. Examining physicians, however, said decomposition of the body altered the appearance of the wounds sufficiently to mislead the investigators. Dr. C. D. Newell, Fresno pathologist, said yesterday that the scratches and what appeared to be wounds from a beating could have been caused by Tanaka thrashing around before he died. Newell said the branches of the tree were probably responsible for the wounds. A note found in Tanaka's belongings and translated from Japanese by Tom Okinawa, Fresno attorney, indicated the man intended to take his life. Tanaka sent $200 to a brother in Japan a few days before he died and had no known enemies. After a survey was made, it was learned the scene of his death was 80 feet inside Fresno County. End of articles. Well, that's just one of the most stunning medical reversals in the annals of California crime. It really did seem that upon first hearing the description of the crime scene and how the body was hanging from one ankle, that this poor man had been tortured and left to die by persons unknown. Can you imagine if any of the boys who made the discovery had acted suspiciously or if an anonymous tipster had told the sheriff that they knew someone who had threatened Tanaka? If they had established a strong suspect from the start, the examining physician and pathologist may not have returned with the coroner's verdict determining death by suicide. Still, it is a very strange set of circumstances and presents a weird and awful set of injuries. Also, it's unusual, to say the least, that a suicide would hang himself by an ankle. I've wondered about that, and I think perhaps he climbed into the tree, affixed the rope to a branch, and then put the loop down on a branch held under his foot as he stood or sat there, contemplating the end of his life. Then perhaps something startled him, or bit him, or he slipped, getting his ankle caught in the loop and falling upside down with his head above the ground. Either that or perhaps he felt hanging upside down would cause him to die painlessly as he passed out and died. However it happened, apparently he greatly regretted the position he found himself in and valiantly struggled to free himself, causing a great many wounds from bark and branches that appeared like whippings and cigarette burns. The thing is, even if some of the wounds were not cigarette burns, but were caused rather by sharp branches, that doesn't mean they were self-inflicted. Had this gone to trial with vigorous and opposing defense and prosecution experts testifying on the wounds, a jury may have ruled in favor of murder. Either way, murder or suicide, the grim reality is that poor Mr. Tanaka was tortured in mind and body before his death. Suicide investigation is strange because it doesn't seem to take much to build a case around it when evidence for murder has been craftily concealed. Someone says they heard the deceased was unhappy about something and suddenly a suicide can be easier to conclude than a murder, especially in tough cases involving drowning, shooting with a gun present, hanging, and falls. Two other old cases are brought to mind, both in Southern California, where men sent their families in cars over steep cliffs into the most frightening horror of death below in rock-strewn canyons. Murder was proven in both these cases, even though the suspects 
claimed they were accidents. One of these monsters made his murder case easier to prove by climbing down into the canyon and dispatching all the victims with blows to their heads in case they were still alive. And these blows were all seen to be entirely similar and not made during the initial and strewn out crash. Yet even in our modern and microscopically tested CSI world, forensic science and junk science are still fighting it out and struggling for truth with, for example, once promising bite mark evidence going out of favor, which is not to say that some murderers do not leave bite marks on the skin of their victims, just that other things make marks that can look like bites and varying rates of decomposition can render specific causes uncertain. Perhaps the greatest recent case to exonerate the convicted was that of the West Memphis Three, sent to prison for the murders of three young boys. In their case, expert testimony showed that previous evidence of serrated survival knife marks on skin was wrong and was more probably made by wild animals, adding one more reason the West Memphis Three were released from prison. Given the problems the 1957 Tanaka case gave to authorities, as well as a host of so many more since then where wounds causation was difficult to decipher, you would think everyone in this great land of ours would be all for the study of the dead by law enforcement for the very best scientific understanding of the deceased. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. To this end and to this point, I would like to recommend the insightful documentary of Dolls and Murder, directed by Susan Marks, on the miniature nutshell studies of unexplained death created by heiress Frances Glesner Lee. She really did something entirely unique and visionary for her time. The realistically rendered and detailed miniatures are still training law enforcement officers to this day. The documentary interviews key forensic experts and again regarding the needed and evolving science of forensic pathology takes a trip to a body farm, in this case the University of Tennessee Anthropological Research Center. An informative tour is provided by Rebecca Wilson, someone who is compassionate and very dedicated to the serious work there and who you might say is even reverential toward the donated physical remains that serve the high purpose of for one, studying the rates of decomposition under different conditions as a grim but necessary aid to law enforcement. Unfortunately, Ms. Wilson tells us the center at times receives less than positive feedback from the outside and that she has been called this horrible person. That to me was the saddest thing I heard in the documentary. It's wrong and she and the rest of the staff don't deserve it. Bodies are studied there as an aid to society, just as bodies are studied at medical universities and have been for hundreds of years for the understanding and treatment of disease, which of course was also met with opposition. To the body farmers in Tennessee and elsewhere, I don't envy your job as you must have heard many times before, but thank you for your vital contribution to law enforcement. Thank you for bringing your work to a wider public through films such as Of Dolls and Murder. And thank you for the care and professionalism you bring to the physical remains and to your science. I don't know if anyone really likes to dwell on our ultimate demise, but we can certainly salute dedicated law enforcement officers, officials, forensic scientists, and medical examiners, all with limited resources, 
ever pushing the boundaries of science and education forward. For at the very least, in cases like Tanaka's, farm worker of Reedley, California, an early and accurate understanding of how bodily wounds are obtained, no matter how strange in a case of suicide or accidental death, streamlines and allocates resources for the really tough unsolved cases that may take months, if not years, to solve. Thank you for listening. Feel free to leave your comments and hit the like button, which of course is not a like for the crime, but rather helps to bring in more listeners who are looking for this type of historical material and whose comments on the subject may be helpful. If you have thoughts about suicide, please call a suicide hotline.